One of the best things that you can do for weight loss is changing the times that you eat, that makes a big difference. And changing the food you eat makes a huge difference. 63% of Australians are either overweight or obese. I think that America's not far behind. This is Barbara O'Neill, a famous health expert known worldwide. She strongly supports holistic and natural health, with many testimonials backing her methods. In this video, Barbara is going to share some very effective weight loss tips. Losing weight isn't just about appearance, it's about feeling healthier and more energetic. Frustrated by diets that don't offer lasting results? So maybe you are doing it all wrong. Join us as we dive into practical strategies for lasting success. The first thing I'm going to look at, and there are a few factors that come together to cause this, and that number one is the food that we're eating. When we looked at the liver, we looked at this. And this morning when we looked at diabetes, we looked at this. So we're going to look at again in relation to weight. And it's the high carbohydrate diet that many people are eating today. So bread, bread is very common. Cereal, there's a whole aisle devoted to cereal. And many people having bread and cereal for breakfast by mid-morning, they're wanting something else. So they reach for, and we're just gonna say cakes, etc. because if we say everything, um, there's not enough room on the board for it. When you go into muffins and croissants and donuts and pasties and pies and pastries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're just gonna put et cetera. Also, uh, pasta. I'm a fifth generation Australian Scottish descent. I didn't know what pasta and pizza was till I was about 18. So what did I grow up with? Sausages or chops, mashed potatoes, frozen peas or beans every single night of the week except for Sunday when mum would do a roast lamb. And everyone I knew ate like that. I actually didn't, had never even heard of brown bread. So this was real traditional Australian. Rice, I'd never had rice. I don't think I went to a Chinese restaurant till I was about 18. And that's the first time I ate rice. Potatoes, well, we ate potatoes every meal. And last and certainly least in nutritive value is the pure crystallised acid extracted from the sugarcane plant. So the following high carbohydrate foods are bread, cereal, cakes, etc., pasta, pizza, potatoes and sugar. And especially the last one, sugar, something so sweet but has become such a big part of our diets worldwide. As sugar intake has increased, so have problems like obesity and diabetes, highlighting shifts in our eating habits over time. And so it brings the glucose, the glucose goes in under the action of insulin, goes through the 20 step pathway. I'm sure everyone's very familiar with the inside workings of the cell now, yes? And that 20 step pathway gives us two units of energy. Isn't that why we eat, to get glucose, to, to run our energy cycles? The end result of the 20-step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. And pyruvate, as the chemical form of glucose, gets fed into what's called the powerhouse. Called the powerhouse because these eight little chemical reactions, this eight-step pathway, delivers... Uh, impressive 36 units of energy. And the reason why the eight-step pathway gives 36 units of energy is the presence of oxygen. So this is called the aerobic pathway, whereas this pathway is called the anaerobic pathway because it does not use oxygen, it produces energy by the process of fermentation. So when when we eat the carbohydrates, they're broken down to glucose. The first place the glucose is sent is to the cell. The second place it is sent, because only so much can go through the energy cycles, then it is stored as glycogen. We looked at this this morning and how that's particularly useful for the diabetic, having these little, well, it's useful for everyone because they're little molecules of glucose sitting in the muscle cell. And that's why the best place to, or the best time to exercise is early morning. 
because in early morning, when you're starting to move, some people say, well, how are we going to get fuel to actually exercise? It's your glycogen stores already sitting in your muscle cell. And when the, when the cell needs it, it's plucked and it's released. Amazing process. But on the high carbohydrate diet, and this is what a lot of people don't realise, especially when people go on a weight loss diet and stop all the fat, yeah? Fat free this, fat free that, fat free, fat free, fat free. And yet what are they eating? Lots of carbohydrates. Do you know fat gives the feeling of satiation or satisfaction? And the best weight loss diet is a diet that stops your hunger. Fat is crucial for feeling satisfied after eating, which is essential for a balanced diet. When people cut fats and overconsume carbs, especially for weight loss, they often overlook this. Carbs break down into glucose for immediate energy, with excess stored as glycogen in muscles, acting as a reserve for when the body needs fuel, like in the morning. And fat stops the hunger. So what's happening on this high carbohydrate diet, people have eliminated the fat and they're eating lots and lots and lots of this, not realising that that excess glucose, once we've filled up the energy cycle, we've filled up the glycogen stores and so now the body sends it to the fat cells. And on this high carbohydrate diet, what's happening to Americans and Australians? They're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. In fact, it's one of the most dangerous fats because what the body does is it stores it in the probably areas of the body that's not used a lot, maybe the arms, the belly, the, the hips, the the thighs and then when that all gets when that gets all filled up then it starts to go to the internal organs weigh, weighing them down and in the book wheat belly notice the title of the book wheat belly dr william davis he shows that sugar particularly sugar and the hybridized wheat and the hybridized wheat is found in most breads, cakes, cereals, pastas, pizzas. Because it gets the blood sugar level up so high, so fast, as we looked at this morning, then very quickly it's dumped as a visceral fat on the belly. And in the book Wheat Belly, I think the word wheat belly, he uses in just about every page, <laughs> showing this process. And another fact, Another very misunderstood fact is that glucose burns at four calories per gram. Whereas fat, it burns at nine calories per gram. Now this, this piece of information, which is fact, is in just about every weight loss book as proof that if you want to lose weight, don't eat the fat. It's going to give you more than twice the calories. But what the people don't understand is what a calorie is. A calorie is a unit of energy. And if you want a high energy food, what do you eat? Ah, uh, fat. <laughs> it's going to give you more than twice the units of energy compared to glucose. But if you're eating more calories than you can burn, yes, it's going to be stored. The problem isn't just calorie count, but how our bodies process different calories. Excess carbs, especially refined sugars, spike insulin and promote fat storage, worsened by diets high in processed foods. In contrast, moderate intake of healthy fats offers sustained energy, supports weight loss and helps stabilise blood sugar. That's why one of the best things that you can do for weight loss is to eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, and then tea like a pauper, or you call it uh, supper, yeah? I think that when I say tea, you probably think I mean a cup of tea, yeah? But we call an evening meal tea. And as one lady said to me, well, what do paupers eat? I said, sometimes nothing. What many people are doing today 
and I see it in many countries I go to, they eat breakfast like the pauper, they eat lunch like the pauper and the tea or the supper is the king and the queen together. That's like going on a journey and you start your long journey and you go to the gas station, we call it a petrol station, call it a gas station, and just put a little bit in. And then an hour later, put a little bit more in. And then an hour later, put a little bit more in. And then, an, and then you've done this all day. And then you finally get to your destination. You go into the gas station and you fill your tank and then park it in the garage. How much sense does that make? <laughs> and yet that's what most people are doing. Little bit here, little bit there, little bit there. End of the day, king and the queen together. And the body says... Finally, finally we've got some nourishment. And then they say, oh no. They've Irregular eating patterns disrupt the body's natural rhythms, leading to inefficient metabolism and energy storage. Skipping meals during the day and overeating at night throws off the balance needed for optimal function. Breakfast jumpstarts metabolism and provides essential nutrients, like fueling up for a journey. Lunch sustains energy, keeping us productive, while dinner should be lighter, helping the body wind down for rest. But the beauty of the plant proteins, it's much cleaner burning fuel. It doesn't leave an acid waste like the protein does. And when I was consulting with this man, he said to me, I believe if Dr Atkins had read the China study, Atkins would have become a vegetarian. What an interesting comment. So you can, do a, you can get those results, but on, you can do it on a plant diet as long as you do the legumes. And so many people say, oh, legumes, you've got to soak them, you've got to cook them. Well, when you go home tonight, just fill up the saucepan and fill it up with lentils. <laughs> in the morning, rinse it well, bring it to the bowl, rinse it again, put it in your slow cooker. So let's look at protein, animal protein. Only 58% is burnt as fuel. So that's a 42% waste. That's the acid waste. And that's what uh, Dr. Colin Campbell found in his book, uh, The China Study. He could switch cancer cells on and off, and we looked at this briefly when we looked at cancer on the first night, because it's an acid waste. And cancer thrives in an acid environment. We looked at that. Whereas plant protein, it's a lot cleaner burning fuel. It doesn't have that acid waste. So with plant protein, you're getting up to about 80% 80, 80 easy is burnt as fuel. That's, that's a big difference. So your plant protein is a superior protein. What Atkins found, and I found this interesting, he found that these... Three food groups are the essential food groups. <coughs> Fibre is essential because the colon needs to be swept. We looked at that when we looked at the colon, when we looked at the waste disposal organs. Protein is essential because the crosswood bands, remember we looked at the DNA on the first nights, made up of amino acids. Amino acids is a breakdown from the protein we, we eat. And it's amino acids that builds the new cells in the body. And 50% of the membrane around every cell in the body is protein. That's essential. Fat is essential. The fat-free diet is a dangerous diet. There are fats that'll kill and there are fats that'll heal. And because there are some killer fats, they've all been dumped in the same basket. What are the killer fats? The altered fats. You see, for centuries, people use the coconut oil and the olive oil. They can be extracted from the flesh of the plant. But those hard seeds, they couldn't really get the oils out until, until they developed high heat chemical equipment to extract oil from hard seeds. And because they use chemicals and heat, they destroy the oils immediately. So there's clear plastic bottles that have got sunflower oil, peanut oil, <laughs> soy oil. Don't touch them. They're the oils that can help to damage the arterial wall. They're the dangerous oils. And your deep fried foods. If you do fry any food, 
it should be always in a saturated fat because saturated fat is heat resistant and light resistant. It doesn't, the heat does, isn't, doesn't destroy them, yeah? Your brain is the fattiest organ in the body. It must have fat. The myelin sheath that is around the arm that comes out of the nerve cell, it's mostly fat. If someone's on a fat-free diet, on cholesterol-lowering medication, because that fatty substance is mostly cholesterol and it protects the nerve cell. So if someone's on a fat-free diet, cholesterol-lowering medication, and got a mouthful of mercury and eating fish every day to try and get some more protein, but they're having huge amounts of mercury and big exposure to chemicals, well, that's disaster. There's your Parkinson's disease. There's your multiple sclerosis. There's your dementia and your Alzheimer's because then the brain cells are getting damaged. So we need to be having nice amounts of fats. How much? Well, not much. It's a very concentrated food. Maybe a teaspoon a meal, maybe not even that. You don't need much. I don't know about you, but I couldn't drink a cup of oil. No, no, not attractive. But you would be surprised how much oil a person is consuming when they eat a whole meal of, say, fish and chips and scallops, all that fried food. They're almost consuming nearly probably between half a cup and three quarters of a cup of fat. And it's damaged fat. That's the fat that is dangerous. There's no doubt about that. But because there are dangerous fats, unfortunately, they've all been classified as dangerous. But they are not. And we need some. Our brain needs some. So basically, not all fats are harmful. While altered fats from processed oils can damage health, natural fats like those in coconut and olive oil are essential, especially for brain function. Avoiding fats entirely can lead to issues like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, but consuming healthy fats in moderation is vital for overall well-being. I gave the story this morning when I talked about diabetes of, of Jim, the guy who was a type 1 diabetic and got off all his medication. And do you remember the weight loss he experienced? Quite phenomenal. And it wasn't just that he was eating breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen and tea like a pauper. It wasn't just that he was on a low <coughs> carbohydrate, high fibre, generous protein and healthy fat diet. It was also the fact that he began to drink more water. He was having eight to 10 glasses of water a day. And when you start drinking more water, it's also time to start having some whole salt. But it's the fourth point that I think made a dramatic effect. It, it all has an effect. And that was the high intensity interval training. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take you inside the cell and show you why the high intensity interval training is so affected. So this is intervals of high intensity, intervals of recovery, and it's done for a cycle. And Doug McGuff, the heart doctor, he, he suggests 30 seconds high intensity, 90 seconds recovery for a cycle of six. There's 15 minutes a day. Sorry, but uh, no excuse. <laughs> if you haven't got 15 minutes, start to write down how long you're on the computer, how long are you on the phone, how long are you on your iPad. How long do you spend watching television? Mm -mm. And you will quickly see time to do some adjustments with your time. What I want to show you is what happens inside the cell when you do the high intensity interval training. Now before I go there, just let me define high intensity. It's anything that gets the heart rate up and the breathing. So Michael and I, we run up hills every day and our recovery is walking down hills and we run up the other hill. When I was in Germany two weeks ago, uh, where I was staying was in, a, was in a little village and the house I stayed with was right up on the side of a hill. So anywhere I went, when I went back home, I had some high intensity. And I found a path through the forest. And in this forest track, I got five high intensities. 
And I wasn't even running, it was just walking. And it was a track that was made for a tractor, so it wasn't for a car, because I don't even know if a car would have got up those, those steep ones. Sometimes you don't even need to run. All I need to do was walk and walk fast up these really steep bits. Most of the research has been done on an exercise bike where the person, if they're unstable on, your, on their feet, they're holding on. It's very good if they've got hip or knee or ankle problems, then, then the weight is not on those areas. And you can cycle as fast as possible and then your recovery time can just be slow cycle. It could be swimming, doing laps of the pools. It could be push-ups. The recovery time is really just till you feel it's time to run again or it's time to go fast again. It doesn't have to be 90 seconds, but that's what you're aiming for. Your recovery time is an indication of your fitness. The longer you take to recover, it's usually an indicator that the more unfit you are. And if you take a long time to recover, don't worry about it, this is progressive. That's what Al Sears book says, progressive acceleration of cardiopulmonary exertion, pace. So as, as you get stronger, as your body gets fitter, you, you'll be able to do uh, less recovery time. And that's it for today, guys. Thank you for joining today's discussion on weight loss by Barbara O'Neill. Remember, maintaining a healthy weight involves sustainable lifestyle changes understanding your body's needs, making mindful food choices, and staying active. Apply these insights to your daily life, and small steps can lead to significant progress to weight loss. If you have questions or want to share your experiences, feel free to reach out. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel, and as always, stay informed, stay healthy.